I think most people in this room would probably agree that uh, the state of public education today is, is in shambles. I was at a debate with someone earlier today about particularly Chicago public schools. Uh, and I said, there's a, I, I've been told on a number of counts that I'm wrong on a number of things about prescriptions for public education. But nobody ever tells me, uh, Cone, you're, you're, you're just wrong. CPS, that's a system that's educating children. Uh, we, for the most part, we'll, we can agree that it's in shambles and that uh, it, it needs to be either fixed or dismantled, that changes need to be made to public education. So the question that we're going to ask is uh, really the, the most forceful idea that, uh, or at least the most consequential uh, and has been carried forward is the idea of school vouchers, which uh, Milton Friedman posed in his Capitalism and Freedom in, uh, in 1959. Um, it's been carried forward and advanced in a lot of states. There are a lot of school choice programs, and the uh, foundation that bears Milton Friedman's name continues to advance school choice and school voucher programs today. However, uh, what we want to ask is whether school vouchers are the best way to introduce choice into the school system. And for that, uh, tonight we are joined by Paul Sippel, who is an independent financial advisor and a CPA in business for himself and Bruno Behrendt, who is the director of the Center for Education Transformation at the Hartland Institute. And our question, are school vouchers the best way to introduce school choice? Bruno. The answer is yes, they are. Uh, let's start by this. What is your goal as, as thinkers, as people who want to accomplish something in education? What is your goal? Do you want a better education for the vast majority of American children uh, here in the United States in real time and real possibility, or are you looking for an ideologically pure, theoretically pretty education system that can exist in your head but nowhere else on the planet and that can never get passed into law? That is basically the question before us today. I would argue that the education transformation that's necessary in America today is not only a moral issue, but it's also a political issue. It is a political fight that has to be won politically. It is not really an academic issue. It is not really a debate between whether teachers unions and administrative bloat and massive spending on a public education system works. We know that to the extent that it works, it's far too expensive and it doesn't work for the vast majority of the children. Or do we want to come up with a better system? My definition of a better system is this simple. I'm looking for replacing the government education complex with an open source learning network where the money follows the child to a vast new array of education options across the country. Everywhere, not just here in Chicago, but across the country. Options like the digital education, options like a charter school, options like a private school, options like a, a, a mix of homeschooling and going to a library. These are the solutions that need to happen. I don't think they can happen in any other system except for where the money follows the child. So what then might be another solution? Are charters the solution? I think they might be a necessary half step, but they don't really complete the task. Uh, is there a way that we can have um, other way that we can have money tied to the consumer? I don't think there is. Now, we get a lot of this about the federal and the state constitutions, and education shouldn't really be part of the government uh, decision. But the fact of the matter is that while there's nothing about education in the federal constitution, every state in the nation, in their state constitutions, has the responsibility to educate the, the, the populace. Now, we may disagree with that. We may not like that idea, and we may do what we want to do to change that. But the fact of the matter is states have the regulatory, taxation, and, and, and legal authority to create an education system. So the question becomes not whether we want to go through some theoretical construct, but whether there's a better way to have an education system than to have it through money going into districts, money going to teachers unions, money going to administrators. And is there a mechanism that accomplishes that goal? Vouchers accomplish that goal. They create a system where the money is tied to the parents and the children deciding on the best option for their family. Now, there's a Rothbardian dream. There's the separation of school and state. There's the pure libertarian ideal. There's the Cato Institute saying that we can do all of this through 
some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, tuition tax credits, which basically are vouchers by a different name, uh, operated differently. The fact of the matter is, <coughs> vouchers work. Vouchers can be done legally, they are constitutional, and they are the most effective way to uh, create a, a better education system. I'll leave you with this. You can argue that we should do something and, and we should keep things the way they are because we want to save the 5 or 8% of people who are in private schools, or we can come up with a system that takes the 95% of the children in America outside of the prison-like public schools that they're in right now and offer them a better opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Brown. Paul. Okay, I'm going to uh, start off with an analogy I gave a few people earlier, but they'll have to bear with it again. Um, when I was a little kid, my parents uh, used to take us out to dinner, and we would always pick these names of restaurants out of a hat, which, you know, I always got all excited for. And uh, I was always happy because I just wanted to go just about anywhere. But um, it wasn't until years later that I learned that my mother, even she can be corrupted by power, wonderful woman, though, um, wrote the same name, six times. <laughs> now what she could have done is given me given uh, 12 choices instead of six, in which case she still would have written the same name 12 times. So I would have had more choices, but the idea of choice is very much an illusion. And the idea that when we have a choice of going to private schools versus public schools, the idea that we are somehow improving ourselves is really uh, a misnomer. Um, to get into it a little bit more, um, the idea that government schools control us is no different than when we go to a private school and the school accepts vouchers. Because when we accept vouchers, when we accept vouchers, government money always comes with government controls. And ultimately, we're not also going to be allowed to discriminate. If we own a private school, we have to accept any student that wants to go when we accept vouchers. And when we fail to discriminate, and we're not allowed to discriminate, that ultimately decreases the quality of any institution. Going back even further, we look to Plato, who ultimately was the intellectual father of statism and public education. He believed that children are to be wards of the state. He believed that we are to be educated in such a way so we can obey the state. The reason why we have classrooms, 42 minute increments, the reason why we have to ask for a hall pass so we, in order to go to the bathroom. This is not so different than the way private schools look. And the idea I think we should ask is what is education? Um, what does it actually mean to be educated? Do we actually want to improve our knowledge of the world, or do we simply want to make the system more efficient? Do we want to move towards liberty, or do we want to move away from liberty? And a very good question to ask is, is school vouchers and making the government more efficient a step towards liberty, or is it a step away from liberty? Peter Drucker once said, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently, that's that which should not be done at all. H.L. Mencken said that all government is evil, reforming it is largely a waste of time. Milton Friedman did some wonderful things for us, like giving us the negative income tax, uh, like giving us the withholding tax, like giving us uh, being the intellectual father behind central banking. All of that made government much more efficient. And if we could easily, we could certainly have the debate that government uh, should more efficiently tax us. There's only two things that government does well. One of them is stealing, and the other is killing people. So we certainly don't want to make the government more efficient in anything. And when we introduce a voucher system, we also distort the little bit of the free market that we have left. We look at whether or not someone wants to start a private school or has a private school and chooses not to accept vouchers. Now, they may still be able to survive, but they have to compete against all the schools that did choose to accept vouchers. And what about religious institutions or homeschoolers? Majority rule is mob rule. And just because the majority of people think that vouchers is a better idea doesn't mean that it helps the minority of people that choose to homeschool their children. If everybody doesn't like my Pink Floyd shirt here, and doesn't like the idea of we don't need no education, we don't need no thought control, and they vote that I should take it off, and only one person, me, wants me to have it, that would certainly be a violation of my liberties. And the idea that we should have the majority decide what people should be doing is not right. It's the parents that should be deciding, 
not the, not the schools, not the government. Thank you, Paul. Bruno? Well, oh. so many uh, thoughts, uh, not enough time. Um, the interesting thing about the, many of the things that Paul said is that while they sound rhetorically pretty and brilliant, they're simply not true. The fact of the matter is that there are vast education choices inside uh, taking a voucher. And it is true that if you're taking government money, there's probably at some level going to be a government string attached. But every single person in this room is still free to not take government money. And this idea that any, and this goes back to the last debate, the idea that anything that goes against our will is somehow some kind of jackbooted government uh, regulation stealing our freedom and stomping on our necks simply isn't the case. The fact is that there are reasons why they put education into the Constitution. Thomas Jefferson incidentally said that we should have an educated populace because only an educated populace is capable of keeping a constitutional republic. It's something I agree with him on. So it is simply wrong to say that to have a voucher gets rid of all choices. The fact is that we have so many choices raining down on top of us right now that will actually free the system. And this goes back to the political portion of this uh, response. This idea that taking advantage of a voucher will somehow destroy all private education or all freedom of thought or, or, or things like that is simply false. The fact is the moment you exercise extra freedom, the moment you are more empowered, you hold on to that power and you actually expand freedom. Parents who use a charter school want more charter schools, which is a good thing. Parents who use vouchers want more freedom for their education. Homeschoolers are the perfect example. They get when you. They are only two percent of the educating uh, populace, but any and every attempt to, to curtail their rights is beat back. So I'll leave you with this one real simple thing. Paul would like you to believe that vouchers will somehow enthrall all of us in this uh, in this uh, private uh, in this in this public system. He's missing the fact that all of us are already caged in this private system, public system. And vouchers actually offer, offer us an opportunity out of that cage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul? Yeah, I will um, comment, I guess, on uh, what Thomas Jefferson said about education. Um, I'm not an expert on the Constitution. I, didn't, I don't believe there's any mention of public education in the Constitution. And, um, you know, Mark Twain had said, I may have mentioned, that you know, I'll never let my schooling get in the way of my education. And I don't know if the education of a voucher system going to government-controlled schools that's based on making children more obedient is the kind of education that Thomas Jefferson had in mind. The other issue is vouchers, they're an income transfer program in two respects. Not only will people be forced to pay for the education of other people's children, voucher dollars will be an additional tax burden. And voucher proposals never advocate any reduction necessarily in funding for public schools uh, to pay for them. Uh, the best question to ask is, do vouchers increase the power of the government and increase the coercive powers of the state, or do they decrease them? It's not to say that only vouchers will encapsulate us in a government cage, and I don't deny that we're not only not free now, but the best question you ultimately have to ask is, does the voucher system give the government more power or less power? If it gives the government more power, in no way, shape, or form are vouchers a form of compromise. They are a step not towards liberty, but away from liberty. And the only step towards liberty is to decrease the power of the government over our lives. Not to imply they don't have it, but that's the ultimate question as to, be, as to ask. And if we want to make the government more efficient, or if we want to make the government smaller. The voucher system makes the government more efficient, but it certainly doesn't make it smaller. Thank you, Paul. Round of applause for both of our